Thank you, and I'm the executive director of the Jewish Community Relations Council of Minnesota and the Dakotas. And welcome to our living room webinar. I hope you are well and safe. I welcome you on behalf of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits, the JCRC of Minnesota and the Dakotas. And I pinch in for John Pratt, large shoes to fill. Hopefully John will join us soon. Let's keep in mind this is the month of April with Passover, Easter, and Ramadan. And certainly we all apply our levels of faith to our traditions, to this moment in our history. I'm thankful for our first responders and medical personnel for their missions of mercy under difficult and dangerous conditions. Thankful for the bipartisan leadership of the governor, the lieutenant governor and the speaker, majority leader and the legislators from Minnesota. Thankful for the bipartisan efforts of our Minnesota federal delegation, our senators and our members of Congress. Thankful hugely for the foundational and philanthropic community stepping forward. Minneapolis Foundation, the Otto Bremer Trust, the St. Paul Foundation, amongst many, many philanthropic entities. And thank you today to our partners, the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, Nail, Aline Meredith, the Minnesota Council on Nonprofits, John, Marie, Courtney, and our fantastic JCRC team. I'm pleased we're together in this time of physical distancing. We have with us today the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, Neil Kashkari, and Neil's had that position since February 1, 2016. Importantly, he serves on the Federal Open Market Committee, bringing the Ninth District's perspective on monetary discussion in Washington, D.C. Equally importantly and very relevantly, he established the Opportunity and Inclusive Growth Institute, whose charge is to help provide the economic well-being for all Americans, something that is deeply important to us today in this moment of economic uncertainty. Also of critical relevance, John Neal was the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury. He oversaw the TARP program, the Troubled Assets Relief Program during the Great Recession. So Neil, you're bringing to us tremendous experience at a time when it is so deeply and profoundly needed in our state, in our region, and in our country. Christine and Neil have a daughter, Uli, who's 14 months old. Congratulations again, Neil. And we're like looking to hear from you. You'll hear and give us a little bit of report analysis of the economic impact of COVID-19, federal actions, congressional actions. We could talk for days about all these topics, but we're delighted that you're joining us for today. So thank you very much, Neil. Steve, thank you very much for inviting us. We really appreciate it. Uh, and thanks to my colleague, Aline, will be uh, speaking here in a few minutes. Thanks to everybody who has tuned in. We appreciate your interest. A lot of people always ask me, you know, Steve mentioned that I was at the U.S. Treasury Department during the financial crisis, serving under both presidents Bush and Obama. A lot of people ask me, how is this crisis different than the 08 crisis? And, you know, for starters, it's obvious this is a healthcare crisis. It's not starting in the banking sector. In 2008, it was a banking and housing focused crisis that ended up infecting much of the U.S. economy. This time, it is obviously a healthcare crisis. You know, I use an example that this is a little bit like a natural disaster, like a hurricane, but in many ways, so much worse. You know, think about the worst hurricanes that have hit America. Think about Katrina. It was obviously devastating for New Orleans, devastating for the people of New Orleans. But as devastating as Katrina was, relative to the scale of the U.S. economy, Katrina was still very small. It doesn't, you know, even those devastating hurricanes don't really show up in national economic statistics because the U.S. economy is so large. This a healthcare crisis, this COVID crisis, is like a hurricane that's hitting the entire U.S. economy at once. It's literally affecting our economy nationwide. And you're seeing that in these profound, shocking, and very disturbing unemployment numbers, three and a half million last week, six and a half million now reported today. These are you know, spikes in unemployment, an order of magnitude larger than anything we'd ever seen before. Uh, and that's just the scale of this healthcare crisis that is hitting us. In terms of the policy response, you know, there's some other differences. Uh, in the 08 crisis, the Federal Reserve and the Treasury were really the first responders in trying to arrest that crisis. This time, obviously, the healthcare workers are our first responders, the doctors, the nurses, the scientists, the folks that are trying to develop vaccines or develop the tests. They are the first responders and making sure that they have the resources and the equipment that they need has got to be our highest priority because they are ultimately what's going to determine how we are able to control this virus or not. The second round of defense is all of us, all of us participating in social distancing. For the last three weeks, the Minneapolis Fed and most of the Federal Reserve Banks or now all of them have been in a working from home posture. At the Minneapolis Fed, we have about a thousand employees and 95% of us are now working from home. 
uh, and we're able to keep all of our main operations functioning. We're able to accomplish what we need to accomplish for our district and for the financial system. But that's an important step in slowing the spread of the virus so that our healthcare workers and our scientists have time to catch up to try to get their arms around it. The third line of defense are our fiscal policymakers, and that's the U.S. Congress, the action that they've taken uh, last week and before uh, to try to put resources to arrest this crisis and help us get through it. It's state legislators, it's local leaders. At the Minneapolis Fed, we've had many conversations with federal, state, and local policymakers to share what we're seeing in the economy, and they've asked us our ideas on fiscal programs they could put in place to help businesses and help workers navigate this, and we're happy to partner with them and share our ideas. And then I would say the fourth round of defense this time is really the Federal Reserve. What we are doing at the Fed is doing our part to make sure that the financial system is functioning. So you've seen, not only did we cut interest rates down to effectively zero about three weeks ago, but we have rolled out numerous emergency lending programs that are all designed to make sure that the financial markets are functioning. What happens in a crisis when everybody gets scared, both businesses and individuals, people tend to want cash. They're saying, I'm just scared about the future and I want cash. And whether that's cash under my mattress or in my safe, or if it's a big business saying, hey, I don't know what the future is going to hold. I'm going to draw down my credit line. I'm going to borrow from banks to put it in my bank account because I'm going to feel safe for having that cash. If everybody does that at the same time, it causes stresses on the banking system. And that is literally why the Federal Reserve exists. We, in all central banks, were created our first job is to be the lender of last resort. That's the technical term. When the banks are under stress because everybody's saying we want cash, they can then turn to the Federal Reserve and get loans from the Federal Reserve to meet the cash needs of their companies and their uh, individual retail customers. So that's really what the Federal Reserve has been doing with all of these liquidity programs that we call them, is making sure that there's enough cash in the system to meet all of these demands. Uh, and we're doing that. We know how to do it. We did it in 2008. We're doing it now very aggressively, and it's having positive effects to make sure the financial markets can operate. Now, let me turn to uh, the outlook for the economy. It really does, you've probably heard this from other people, it really does depend on how this virus progresses. If you look at the stock market, there's massive volatility in the stock market. That volatility is driven by the fact that investors are trying to figure out where the virus is going to go, and nobody knows. So when we look at other countries and what the experiences are in other countries around the world and to see what we can learn from them. So if you look at China, uh, China is reporting that they've really got their arms around this virus. They're now able to turn their economy back on, their factories are turning back on, their storefronts are reopening. And I'm hearing that from Minnesota businesses that have operations in China as well. But a question is, as they relax the economic controls, does the virus simply flare back up again? And then does that lead them to have to close down the economy again? We just don't know. Or if you look at Italy, which is probably the worst case example that we have right now, where the, they were, uh, looks like they were slow to respond and the virus spread across the society, they've had to put a very aggressive economic lockdown on the economy to try to slow the spread of the virus. Ultimately, is this, are we headed towards a path of Italy? Are we headed toward the path of China or South Korea? We just don't know right now. And we don't even know right now what the future of the Chinese economy or the South Korea economy holds, just because there's so much uncertainty about the spread of the virus. There's uncertainty about how many people have it. There's uncertainty about how uh, easy it is to spread. It seems like it's quite easy. There's uncertainty about the mortality associated with it. And so right now, unfortunately, there's more that we don't know than we do know. And that's why you're seeing such volatility in financial markets and that's also why you're seeing so many businesses and individuals saying, I just want to hold on to cash because I'm nervous about the future. So, you know, what's the best case scenario that I've heard? The best case scenario is some doctors say that, well, this could be like the flu and that maybe when warm weather comes, it will go dormant over the summer. And then that would give our healthcare system time to catch up uh, before it potentially could flare back up again in the fall. We certainly want our healthcare system to have time to catch up. One of the big fears that you hear about a lot is that if we all got the disease at the same time, then that could quickly overwhelm the healthcare system. And then you'd have a lot of people facing needless deaths because the healthcare system was simply overwhelmed. So uh, the social distancing is meant to slow the spread of the virus to give the healthcare system time to catch up and so as not to overwhelm it. What is the ultimate destination of this? Uh, obviously, 
you know, Angela Merkel in Germany said that she thought 60 to 70% of Germans could ultimately get the disease. That's quite striking. If 60 or 70% of Americans were to get to the disease, uh, that's a lot of people, obviously. In 2009, according to the CDC, almost 60 million Americans, 6-0, had the swine flu. So there are bugs, there are diseases that can spread rapidly throughout our society, but the mortality of the COVID disease seems much higher than the mortality of the flu. That's why it seems to be so much more serious. So, uh, you know, the health experts have said it's a year to 18 months before we would have a vaccine. That's obviously one end point of this. Another end point of this is when we achieve so-called herd immunity, when the majority of Americans would have had the disease and hopefully recovered from it, then you'd have much less propagation because people would at that point be, in theory, immune from the disease. Those are destinations way off into the future. So our economists at the Minneapolis Fed and around the Federal Reserve System are running a lot of different economic models, of different forecasts of how the virus will progress and what that is going to mean for the state of the economy and the future of the economy. Is it going to be a short, we're almost certainly in a recession now with three, three and a half million people getting laid off last week, six and a half million this week. We're almost certainly in a recession. Is it going to be a short recession with a, what we call a V-shaped recession? where there would be a quick recovery, people will get rehired quickly. Certainly we all hope so. Uh, is it going to be a long recession, a U-shaped recession, which goes down and stays low, or an L-shaped recession, where a long, slow recovery? We just don't know right now. It's really going to be determined by how the virus progresses and how the healthcare system is able to respond to it. One thing we know from 2008, when you had millions and millions and millions of Americans losing their jobs, it took more than a decade to put the labor market back together, to rehire all of those people. It took more than 10 years. And so I'm really pleased that a lot of the action by the federal government and the state government has been focused on trying to keep workers in their jobs. So there's a, a program, a small business loan program that's getting a lot of attention where small businesses could get a forgivable loan if they rehire their workers or if they retain their workers. Those are all designed to try to keep workers attached to businesses so that if this is a short recovery, they can quickly go back to work, turn the lights back on and resume economic activity. On the other hand, if this is a long drawn out downturn where you would see thousands of small businesses, you know, they lay off their workers, but they still have a lease or they still have a mortgage. Think about your coffee shop or your restaurant or your gym, but they have no customers. Then you'd see waves, thousands of businesses going through bankruptcies. Then you'd see, uh, empty storefronts, you know, going out of business in the strip mall. And then it would take months for a new business to step in to say, I'm going to take over that space. I'm going to hire new people. I'm going to launch a new business. That kind of process, if you were to see thousands of business go through that, that would, is what would lead to a long, much more shallow recovery rather than a V-shaped recovery. And that's ultimately what we want to try to avoid. So, you know, I am, there's a lot of scary things that I just talked about. Overall, I am optimistic. The 2008 financial crisis was very deep and very serious. And a lot of people were affected. We did get through it. We will get through this crisis. Probably the best news of all is that, you know, there's a lot of political division in America for the last several years. Uh, but our leaders in Washington put politics aside and said that they need to step forward and do what's right for the American people and for the American economy. And I'm, I take great comfort from the fact that they've taken that leadership, passing the $2 trillion bill last week. And I've already heard from several members of the Minnesota delegation that they are gearing up to think about what's next. What else should they be doing to support the American economy? So I think that in a time of national crisis, uh, we as a people, we may have our political differences, but we come together to do what's right for the country and for the American people. And that ultimately gives me uh, confidence. So with that overview, Steve, thank you very much. And thank you, President Kashkari. And I want to say we have over 300 participants today in our living room webinar. Thank you for your participation. Many different nonprofits represented from the full spectrum of Minnesota's wonderful and powerful nonprofit community. So thank you for everything that you're doing either on a primary level or tertiary level for our state and our country and our region at this time. It's now my pleasure uh, to provide an opportunity to Senior Vice President of the Minneapolis District of the Federal Reserve, Aline Trimeroff, and her expertise is in the area in the realm of nonprofits. So Aline, thank you, and looking forward to hearing from you.
Well, thank you so much. I also want to just reiterate my thanks to all of you for being on this call and taking the time to spend with us this afternoon. I, I thought I would share a little bit about what we're doing in community development and the Center for Indian Country Development as you know, this COVID crisis continues to evolve. I would say we're listening and paying really close attention to what's happening in the nonprofit community, not only in Minnesota in the Ninth District, but also across the country and I'm understanding and hearing that the experiences are really different depending on whether or not you're in direct service provision or whether or not you're a nonprofit that was impacted by you know, restrictions on large gatherings, for example. But I would say, regardless of how you're impacted, we've all been impacted in some ways, but um, in many ways, nonprofits are really sometimes the first and the last line of support for many members of our community, especially low and moderate income members of our community. So I feel like it's important to recognize and understand what's happening in your sector. And I wanna make sure that you all know that we hear your concerns and we're trying to make sure that that voice is elevated both locally on the state level and then nationally as we continue conversations um, with policymakers. Um, the Center for Indian Country Development is a national center, a national resource within the Federal Reserve System. And we've done some outreach with our tribal nations across the country. We actually put a survey out into the field to try to have an understanding of the 500 plus uh, tribal nations. Uh, and I, I thought I would share just a couple of quick snippets of what we've heard from some of those tribes. Of the respondents, about 80% have declared some kind of state of emergency. Um, and many of those tribes are both on the front lines of trying to respond to a public health crisis while at the same time trying to support their tribal nation's economies, in many ways similar to state and local governments. And so they're really, uh, I think, concerned about future revenue and especially as casinos and mineral extraction are a really important component of their overall revenue base. On the nonprofit level, we are also coordinating with the 11 other reserve banks within the Federal Reserve System to try to push out a survey in the next week about what's happening within the nonprofit sector. And it would be designed to be kind of a pulse survey so that we could have a sense over time of how you're impacted but also we're looking to try to gather stories about how nonprofits are innovating at this time. I think many of you are in, um, in, in situations where you're forced to innovate just in terms of the way you provide services or the way you engage with community. But also I think that there's probably some really great stories and that, that we could potentially highlight. So um, hopefully in the next couple of days you could look for, or actually, sorry, next week, you could look for a survey from us um, and would encourage all of you to fill that out because that's something that we can pull together and have a sense of what's happening, not only in Minnesota, but we would be working with the 11 other reserve banks in the system to put together a national picture of what's happening with nonprofits. I know that there's been a lot of movement at the federal, state, and local level just in terms of trying to provide immediate relief in, to families, to businesses, to, um, to basically every level of, of our economy and society. I want to call out really briefly state and local governments in the same ways that I was talking about earlier, our tribal nations are kind of at the front lines of a public health crisis. State and local government are also on the front lines of, of a public health crisis where they're being asked to spend additional revenue to support and respond to COVID-19, but they're also seeing and projecting significant declines in future um, tax revenue. Uh, Neil and I have been on a number of calls with state leaders where they're talking about what those potential tax revenue um, tax revenues look like in the future. Just want to point out that state and local governments really are limited in terms of their ability to deficit spend um, and really are feeling this kind of crunch between the need to spend more money and then also the projections of future revenue declines. I know that the CARES Act did provide $150 billion to state and local governments but that was really specifically for COVID related responses and not you know, general fund support for potentially other issues that um, state government or other services that state government would need to provide. And so I really think that that ultimately brings us then to the nonprofits. When you think about federal, state and local government responses and looking at the way nonprofits can kind of step in to fill the gaps within community that uh, we're not able to, to get at through whatever levels of relief that we're seeing uh, coming from the federal government. At the same time, knowing that nonprofits are also experiencing significant and, and concerning um, reductions in their revenue sources. So I think at every level, there's a number of um, kind of constraining or limiting factors for each kind of group that could potentially be supporting community. But I think 
when I think about folks that are really well suited to serve and to provide additional services at the time, I feel like it's the nonprofit community is really well positioned to do that. So with that, I'll, I'll pause and, and turn it back to you, Steve. Thank you, Aline. It's now my pleasure to introduce Ethan Roberts from the JCRC and Marie Ellis from the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits. And they're gonna provide some highlights on federal policy, state policy, and share what nonprofits and the people who care about them, that's all of us, of course, need to know as we navigate through these difficult and uncharted waters. Ethan, if you wanna start, and then Marie, thank you for your expertise and all that you do, the nonprofit community. So thank you, Steve, very much. Um, and thank you, Aline and uh, Neil, for your excellent presentations. Part of the challenge of going after such great presenters is that much of what you are gonna talk about might end up being redundant, but uh, some of this information is very important for people to, to absorb. And so I don't think we can talk about the SBA loan program enough, and Marie's gonna get to that in a second. Um, it is just interesting to chart kind of how the federal government has tried to respond to this, and 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 Aline and Neil both alluded to that. Um, the first act that Congress took was actually on March 4th, which we were talking about beforehand, uh, the panelists, it seems like a lifetime ago. If March wasn't the longest month in recorded history, it was seemingly at least the longest month it felt like in my lifetime. And that then it was an $8 billion uh, response, of which almost all of it was to for testing and to try to stem the tide. Um, at that point, we had 80 known infections, and of course, the number had to have been much, much higher, and only 11 deaths. And now we fast forward to today, and we have uh, known 213,000 plus infections and over 4,500 deaths in the United States. And again, um, we imagine that the number of infected people or people who've been infected and since recovered is, is greatly uh, increased by then. Uh, however, um, what I want to talk about a little bit more because it, it ties into what Aline was talking about in terms of the, the bind that states find themselves in is um, the second package, which was the, the family for, family's first uh, response. And that was done around St. Patrick's Day. So that was around the time that the Minnesota legislature was shutting down. And um, I knew that actually I was supposed to be bringing a bunch of professionals and colleagues from Jewish Family Children's Service who are, like many other social service agencies, doing their work through Zoom or doing their work through the phone calls um, because they work with very vulnerable populations. We were going to come to the Capitol and, and we couldn't. And embedded in that are, are many things regarding unemployment, which Marie will get to, but um, something that kind of harkens back to when I started at the JCRC and started working with the Council of Nonprofits and colleagues back in the, during the Great Recession, which is FMAP. And FMAP is that federal percentage uh, for the Medicaid program. Uh, we share responsibilities um, for paying for uh, Medicaid, or as it's known in Minnesota, MA or medical assistance with the federal government. And we receive roughly half of our money uh, for traditional Medicaid programs. We receive much more for the um, Obamacare, ACA extensions for, for Medicaid. Uh, from the feds. And what the government did um, is the same thing, the same amount actually, that they did during the Great Recession, which was a temporary bump of 6.2% um, in the amount of money that the federal government is going to send to Minnesota for traditional Medicaid um, for this year. Now, this follows a request from the National Governors Association, which is a very bipartisan outfit of Democratic and Republican governors for 12%. We are still hoping that um, in the fourth response, which we think is likely to happen, that we can get up to 12%. But, uh, and this is where I have to put all the caveats in because I, I went to law school, not business school. Um, math is not my strong suit. But I did some calculations this morning and my estimation was that just to 6.2% for Minnesota would conservatively result in 340 million more dollars that would come into our treasury, which we're gonna need because as Aline pointed out, we can't deficit spend. We are constitutionally prohibited from doing that. And so anything the federal government can do, which obviously can deficit spend to help states balance our budgets without having to make cuts, which cut to the bone of services for vulnerable populations is something that we, we all should be advocating for. And, um, that's that's something that's, that'll be the focus of my work. I know that's gonna be the focus of the work of the budget project and of MCN 
and I'll, I'll come back later, but I know that uh, Marie wants to talk a little bit more about unemployment, which is a real concern to, for employers in the nonprofit sector, and uh, some more details about the SBA loan program. Indeed. Thanks, Ethan. I wish I knew where our little boxes were on everyone's screen so I could like, thanks, Ethan, uh, and point at you, but we, we have no, no idea. So thank you or thank you, wherever you might be. Um, I am Marie Ellis. I'm the Public Policy Director at the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits. Our work at MCN is to promote, inform, strengthen, and connect individual nonprofits and the nonprofit sector as a whole. A quick disclaimer, Ethan mentioned law school. Um, Ethan and I are both attorneys, so I just want to add the disclaimer that nothing we are talking about should be construed as legal advice, but rather a general overview of recent, very recent legislation. Um, I'm giving an overview today of uh, the CARES Act, which actually is a fairly relatively normal acronym, um, Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act. That's the $2 trillion economic stimulus package that was passed less than a week ago. That uh, was signed into law on Friday, I believe. So that's the third stimulus package. And as Ethan mentioned, there's likely to be a fourth, maybe a fifth package as well. And so we're continuing to advocate on what should be in those. If you want to find the information we're talking about in written form, um, you can go to our website. Actually, just go to Google, Google Minnesota Council of Nonprofits, and then CARES Act, and you should, the first one should, that comes up should be a page with all this information. Um, because it's so new, there's very little guidance at this point, uh, very little specifics. And so when we get to the Q&A, if you have specific questions and we can't answer them, that is why um, there is literally guidance being put out as we speak. So I'll be talking about some of the key provisions that are of interest to nonprofit organizations. And for the purpose of this, I'm talking about uh, 501c3 organizations when I talk about nonprofits. There are some different rules for 501c4s and c6s and all the other great c's. Um, the first thing, one of the really big things I need to talk about is something that President Kashkari already mentioned, the Paycheck Protection Program. This is also known as the Emergency SBA 7A Loans, and this is the Emergency Loan Program for small businesses and nonprofits qualify to cover the cost of payroll and benefits, operations and debt service, and very importantly, it provides that those loans can be forgiven in whole or in part under certain circumstances. So this is available for nonprofits with 500 or fewer employees. Quick note that that's headcount, not full-time equivalent count. So one of the things we're working on in phase four is to get that changed to a full-time equivalent count. There are, um, there are quite a few nonprofits who have you know, between 500 and 700 employees and a lot of them are, are part-time. We wanna make sure they qualify as well. And a quick note, um, in an earlier version of the bill, Nonprofits who were eligible to receive certain Medicaid payments were um, exempted from eligibility for these loans. That was taken out. So if you hear that, not relevant anymore. You don't need to worry about that. Um, these loans, like I said, can be used for payroll and health and retirement benefits and facilities costs. And if the employer maintains employment for eight weeks after the start of the loan or rehire already laid off employees by June 30th, it, they're eligible to have that um, loan forgiven and essentially turned into a grant. This is a really big deal. Um, we are expecting many, many nonprofits and small businesses to apply for these. I've heard a lot of different estimates on when the money will run out. So um, if anybody knows, maybe during the question and answer, that'll be my question. Um, so we'll see. That'll be really interesting to see in the next few days what happens there. Um, Ethan, do you have anything you want to add about Paycheck Protection Program? Sure. Yeah, actually, um, one of the questions um, was, do we think this will be enough money? The answer is, I don't think so. Um, and one of the things that's being talked about for the next package is uh, $120 billion more to this PAYPEC, the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, we, um, in, the, in the Jewish community, would be lobbying to have at least 50% of that set aside for all nonprofits. Um, I have the understanding that nonprofits may have a little bit more difficulty accessing them, these loans in the, in the first go around. What we are hearing from the banks um, is that, here in Minnesota, is that some of the questions that we have, for example, uh, when does this go online? Is it 12.01 tonight? Is it 9 a.m. tomorrow? They don't know. Um, they don't know a lot of things, which they'd like to know. And, and ideally, I think, I mean, I think they should know. So 
the advice which I'm giving uh, to the folks which I represent at the Capitol and are in, in our network is if you have a relationship with a banker, you should be connecting with that person. And you should be as cognizant as you possibly can of the tremendous amount of stress that bank is on right now because they did not anticipate that they would be getting this massive rush of requests to, I mean, these are lifeboats, right? For many organizations and many, and many enterprises, many businesses. And so we're all under all the stress just because of COVID-19 and staying healthy. We're all working from home. And now they're gonna have all of these people, all these organizations coming to them who are, this can make the difference between staying open and not, people having a paycheck or not. And they don't have an understanding fully yet of how it's gonna work. So uh, I think as Minnesotans, we're generally pretty good at being nice and, and we're good at being patient. So reach out. You have to figure out on your own how much you are eligible to, to borrow slash be granted. Um, there are resources out there which we will be sharing. Um, listen to them, listen to the bankers. What are, what are they asking? Because different banks may require different things depending on what their comfort level is. And so um, we are hopeful that, that everyone can get these loans, but it, it's very likely we, we may not. And, and so we will be advocating for additional rounds of this. Um, so that's really the main advice I'd give is, 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 is reach out today, listen to them, be, be, be persistent, but be, but be patient because it, it's not their fault. <laughs> it's not anyone's fault really, but it's certainly not your banker's fault that they don't have the answers to questions, which they love to have answers to. Don't we all love to have answers? I know I do. Um, okay, a couple other pieces that small businesses and nonprofits are eligible for from the CARES Act. One is the Employee Retention Payroll Tax Credit. Mm -hmm. That's a refundable payroll tax credit up to $5,000 for each employee on the payroll. Um, obviously, there are a number of conditions for that. And one of them is that an organization receiving the Paycheck Protection Program loans are not also eligible for these credits. Uh, there are Economic Injury Disaster Loans, EIDL. Those are emergency grants um, where applicants with 500 or fewer employees could be eligible to receive checks within three days, um, checks for $10,000. So that's a really specific, specific piece. Um, and then also the Economic Stabilization Fund. And that's really to keep industries solvent through the crisis. Um, this would be... Uh, Nonprofits who are eligible for this would be mid-size, um, so between 500 and 10,000 employees, and they need to retain at least 90% of their staff at full compensation and benefits. And so like President Kashkari mentioned, all of these pieces are meant to keep employees attached to their employers. That's really the goal. And in my opinion, I think Congress did a pretty good job of that. I think, um, I think it's, it's going to work pretty well, which is great. And then just three other notable pieces of the CARES Act. These are not related to funding for nonprofits specifically. I lied. The first one is. Uh, the second two won't be. So the first one I want to talk about is unemployment insurance relief for certain employers. Nonprofits can choose if they want to self-insure for unemployment relief or if they want to use the state's... I'm sorry. <laughs> Screaming your, at me. your your coworker has an opinion about insurance for nonprofit really. Carl so. really wants to get in on this. Um, yeah, it's very he's exciting. Fine. He's fine. Nobody worry about him. He's he's with his wonderful father downstairs. Um, you probably told him he can't do something, and that's why he needs me. Um, so like I was saying, nonprofits can choose if they want to self-insure for unemployment benefits or if they want to pay into the state's um, unemployment uh, tax. So in the governor's executive order, in one of his first executive orders, he provided um, total relief for those tax paying nonprofits and organizations, but um, there's no state relief right now for the reimbursing employers. So for example, the Science Museum of Minnesota is a reimbursing employer. They have had to lay off 87% of their staff. So all the, um, all the unemployment benefits or the majority of unemployment and benefits that are going to those staff is coming out of a trust fund that was set up by the Science Museum of Minnesota with just their money in it. That will be depleted very quickly, I am certain. Um, in the CARES Act, the federal government um, included 50% relief for those organizations, which is 
much better than nothing, um, but is still going to leave a lot of nonprofits in a situation where they just simply cannot pay those bills. And so we will continue to advocate on both the federal and state levels um, that, that whoever can um, picks up the rest of that bill because nonprofits just won't be able to handle that, I think. Um, a sec another part of the, uh, the CARES Act that I think people are just really interested to hear about is those direct payments. So direct payments of $1,200 for adults and $500 for children um, if you meet certain eligibility of, of income, and those will be going out in a few weeks. And then also expanded unemployment insurance benefits. Um, so the federal government included coverage for workers who are furloughed, gig workers, and freelancers, and then also added uh, payments, added $600 to weekly payments for whatever, on top of whatever states provide. Uh, Minnesota's weekly average unemployment insurance benefit is $464, and so that $600 on top will more than double most recipients' payments um, for four months. Thank, All right. thank you, Marie. Thank you, Marie, for that excellent presentation and to President Kashkari and Aline and to Ethan. I'm going to turn to Q&A now with President Kashkari and I'll ask the first question. Uh, President, right. you are at the rudder for the TARP program. You're at the helm of the Federal, District, Federal Reserve District of Minneapolis as we deploy the Paycheck Protection Program. As Ethan correctly pointed out, the banks will face tremendous pressure and responsibility with respect to implementation of the loans in connection with the Small Business Administration. President Kashkari, what are some principles or uh, points that should govern perhaps the decision-making process with, that, with the loan applications and how would you like to see that unfold given the difficulties that the banking sector and the banks will face in trying to make decisions? Thanks, Steve. I mean, I hope that it will be uh, available broadly to businesses and nonprofits of all, all sizes up to, the, up to the cap, and then they will all equally be able to participate in the program. You know, if you look in the, the U.S. government has a long history, for better or worse, of providing support to big businesses, be they airlines after 9-11 or the auto companies during the financial crisis or the big banks. I don't think we have much experience, if any, of reaching out to thousands of organizations across the country at the same time. And that's why you do have to go through the banking sec sector with big banks and community banks spread out all across America. They're already in the community. So my hope is that this program can be operationalized very quickly. Uh, I hope that they don't need to go back to, you know, you don't need to send your application to Washington for approval. I hope it can be done at the local bank level, branch by branch, so that the money can flow and can get access, get the money out to the small businesses and the nonprofits who need it. And I hope that they're all able to access the program equally uh, with, you know, with no preferences for this size organization or that. I hope, I hope that all the banks say, hey, we're gonna treat everybody fairly. And I think that's the spirit with which they should operate. Thank you, President Kashkari. Anthony or Sammy from the JCRC team, do you have a question that someone has written? So Steve, they've been um, sending us the questions and okay. there's, there's, there's too many good questions to get to all of them. Um, so one question I think, well, there's so many good ones, but um, we've been talking a lot about how Congress, how the federal government's responding by spending a, a lot of money. And so one question that we received was, how is that going to be paid for? Do we, for example, see an increase down the long road of taxes, personal or business? And what impact is, I suppose, the, the borrowing now or potentially the tax hikes or maybe spending cuts later can have on the future economy? Yeah, so that's right. So the federal government is borrowing money. They're issuing treasury bonds, uh, effectively taking money from savers and going and spending that money on all of these various programs that you and your colleague just described. Uh, and eventually the money does need to be paid back. So eventually uh, it will come in form of either higher taxes at some point, you know, as the economy grows uh, and it generates more tax revenue to service this debt, uh, or eventually it could lead to people will be concerned. Maybe eventually it leads to inflation. Right now, the US, the U.S. government is borrowing at such low rates. It's an indication that investors are not worried about inflation in the foreseeable future. Uh, so I don't think inflation is a big worry. I think more likely over time, once the economy gets back to solid footing, then the U.S. government at some point will have to come up with the tax revenue to pay for the borrowing that they have undertaken. Okay. Um, there, there was another question in the future, which I thought was interesting, which was, 
how will business change? And I, I would, by business, I mean for profits, nonprofits. You know, we are now, for example, doing this by Zoom, right? We've, we're doing a lot of things by Zoom. Um, restaurants are doing, if they can, more takeout business. So once, so once someone asked, like, will we see fewer servers? I suppose one could ask, will there be less travel? You know, maybe we don't have to go to Chicago for that two-hour meeting. Maybe you just do it by Zoom. So are you thinking at the Federal Reserve and your colleagues about what the future of work uh, and looks like based upon this forced experiment in a way we're having of doing things, you know, from home and remotely? I, I think so. We're all learning. We're all experimenting just as everybody on this call is right now. One thing I also think about is the psychological scarring to society from events like this. So we know after the Great Depression, the generation that lived through the Great Depression was permanently changed. Even when the economy was on solid footing, people didn't want to invest in stocks, as an example, because they had had such a bad experience with the Great Crash. And it took a new generation of people to put the Great Depression behind them to change their behavior and be willing to take risk again, as an example. After the Great Financial Crisis, 2008-2009, I also think that that left a scar in people who lived through it, who lost their jobs, and they were more risk averse. I think all of us who are going through this, and we're still in early days of how this crisis is going to unfold, I think we, th there will be some lingering effects. So, some of it may be eminently sensible. I'll give you an example. So we have 95% of our employees at the Minneapolis Fed working from home, but you can't print at home because of a bunch of security reasons. We don't let people print at home. Well, a question that I have is why, why did we let people print at work? And if we're able to get by by reading all of our documents on the screen and not printing them, then when we all do go back to the office, do we need to have so many printers? That's a really minor thing. I think there are gonna be a hundred examples like that where we realize we can operate a little bit differently than we have in the past. In addition to whatever the scarring is, like are people just gonna be nervous for a while about going back to restaurants just because they said, you know, I'm just a little bit nervous. Why do I want to go back out? So I think some of it's going to be psychological. Some of it I also think is just going to be lasting productivity improvements. There's a question from uh, Peter McLaughlin. Um, hi, Peter. Good, good to see that you're participating. And it's also forward looking. And it's how should workforce programs, and that comprises a large part of the nonprofit sector, human service agencies, be looking at preparing for the recovery when we hope there will be larger numbers of jobs available. So again, similarly themed, I, I think this is change. And those that maybe realize quicker that we're not gonna go back to how things were, is it fair to say that they might be better positioned to succeed in the, the months and years of the recovery to, to come? I mean, I think one thing that you could be doing now while people uh, are able to collect the unemployment benefits, you know, if this downturn, one option is if it's a quick recovery, then they go back to their old job. And you know, that's probably the easiest for everybody. But while people have this downtime, are there online training programs that they could be using this time to invest in themselves to continue to develop their skills so that when the recovery comes, maybe they're in a position to get an even better job going forward. I think all of us, and I'm gonna to turn to Aline here, should be thinking about, like just as your question, the prior question said, the future may look different than the most immediate past, trying to prepare the workers and, these, and the nonprofits to position themselves to be most useful and contribute the most in that new environment. None of us knows exactly what that future is gonna look like. So I think all of us being a little bit nimble could be helpful. But Aline, I don't know if you have some thoughts on that. No, I mean, I think I completely agree with you, Neil, um, and appreciate the question that there's maybe an opportunity for you know, additional skill building at this time. If maybe workforce at nonprofits that are focused on workforce development, if there's content that could be pushed out that people could continue to take advantage of so that when they do go back um, into the workforce, if they don't go back to their old job, if there's an opportunity for them to, you know, grab a different um, skill set in this time. Question here, great question. Our human service nonprofit is not seeing or even projecting a reduction in revenues per se but a huge increase in demand for our services, e.g. our food shelf use has gone up 60%, 60% in the last two weeks. What we need is significantly more money to meet the significantly increased demand for essential services like food and housing. That aligns with the level of increased need, e.g. 60% increase in food shelf funding. How might that relate to a stimulus package? The question is excellent because it doesn't necessarily fall within the Paycheck Protection Program. How are we going to protect nonprofits given the circumstances? There are monies that have been appropriated 
for nutrition specifically that are in the, that's in the CARES Act that we didn't get to. It's not nearly enough. So for example, I can tell you that 250 million through the Department of Health and Human Services for the, OA, the Older Americans Act. So perhaps the, the folks on the call who asked the question are familiar with that. So 160 million would be home delivered meals and 80 for congregate. Uh, there's flexibility built into this for the school lunch program. There's flexibility built into it for the SNAP program. But in the conversations I'm having with my colleagues across the country, we know that the emergency food shelf program needs more funding. Um, we know that uh, nursing homes, for example, and hospitals need more funding in part because let's say you're a hospital, you're not doing elective surgeries right now, but your cost, which is a way that they help stay in the, in the black, and they are needing obviously more staffing or more equipment. Um, and so it's important that we send these checks to everybody to some extent to keep demand going. It's important that we assist with nonprofits um, which can't do their annual event, for example, in person. But it's also important we don't lose sight on those who are the human service providers, that the food shelves, the nursing homes, the, the folks who are really dealing with the people most vulnerable, that more of the aid is directed directly towards them. And I know that's something, knowing the council of nonprofits and you know, having been a past board member and, and our organization and, and many, that we'll, we'll keep focused on that. Um, and and we're, there's still more to be done, and that's why there needs to be a fourth, and maybe as, as Marie pointed out, a fifth even stimulus package um, that doesn't lose sight of, of those who, for this is not just an inconvenience, this is, this is the potential disaster, you know, and, and people may die of this, not of COVID-19, but because they didn't get the healthcare they needed or the food they needed or the shelter they needed. And, you know, the people who will be most hurt by this will be the poor. They always it's like President Kashkari was about to answer the question. Thank you, Ethan. Yeah. President Kashkari. No, he gave a great answer, a better answer than I could have given. So <laughs> thank you. And I'll actually add to that excellent answer. Thanks, Marie. Um, my colleagues at the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits have also been doing a lot of work with philanthropy um, and foundations okay. and trying to really increase the amounts of money that are available now for those organizations who need it. And to that end, um, on our website, you can find a special edition of the Minnesota Grants Directory. Normally that's something that we charge for, but for this special edition, you can just download it for free on our website. Um, and it's got information about um, different Minnesota and national funding opportunities, specifically responding to the impacts of COVID-19. Thank you. Uh, President Kashkari, we've been focusing for good reason on nonprofits in the nonprofit sector, everyone in a way on screen here is deeply associated with nonprofit management, nonprofit operations, or nonprofit from a global view, as in the case of the Federal Reserve. But interesting question here, maybe you can give a little sort of a philosophical or at least some historical background. A gentleman writes in from the general aviation industry, and we have to recall that so much of the support for nonprofits, of course, is derived from the ability of our for-profit sector to make money, right? Because that helps support the work that we do. What sort of insight or perhaps consolation isn't the right word, can you provide for people in the, the private sector who are providing essential services given the nature of our economy right now? I mean, it's, it's obviously incredibly difficult. And uh, the, the, start, the content that I started with, just how unknowable it is right now, the course of the virus and how long this is going to go and how long the economic shutdown essentially is going to go. That's what is so difficult and so hard for all of us to try to get our arms around. We just don't know right now. Uh, and then to the question about our, you know, our behavior is going to permanently change, or at least for a period of time, you know, once, think about after 9-11 happened, it was an amazing, extraordinary shock to all of us. The airlines and the airports were shut down for about a week maybe four days, I think they actually shut it down. But then they started going again. And I remember flying a few weeks after, you know, we all started getting back to life again. How long is it gonna take this time for us to kind of get back to normal and start doing the corporate travel again, uh, et cetera. I mean, that travel industry, I'll just share something. My wife works for, worked for a global uh, corporate travel management company uh, and they laid off majority of their workers, including my wife. You know, yesterday was her last, was her first day uh, as a unemployed American. Uh, so quite a shock for her, uh, quite a shock for us. Obviously we're very fortunate. We're much more fortunate than most because I have a, a safe job at the Federal Reserve 
Uh, and so we're way better off than most, but this is just affecting, you know, millions and millions of people across the country. And so we just don't know. So the aviation industry is clearly at the front line of this, as is the hotel industry, et cetera. But other industries, think about the auto industry. I don't know very many Americans right now who are buying cars just because people are nervous. So this didn't start in travel, but it's certainly affecting auto workers all across the country. And that's why we just need to get our, get our, let our healthcare system catch up, give them the resources that they need so that then we can get the economy back, hopefully back to some normal. President Kashkari, maybe a lesson or two that you drew from your experiences at the, at the command of the TARP program when we're talking about the interface of perhaps for-profit, the government assistance to for-profits, and then of course derivatively for nonprofits too because the Paycheck Protection Program includes support for nonprofits. A couple lessons or words of wisdom as these hopefully transformative programs come online. Well, one thing is just critical. It was a mistake that we made in 2008 we were too targeted in our programs for housing. We partnered really closely with housing nonprofits who provided housing counseling to get the message out. But we were too targeted and we ended up helping not nearly enough homeowners. The reason we were targeted is many Americans were angry saying, hey, my neighbor was irresponsible. I don't want my neighbor to get a bailout. And so we tried to figure out, well, let's come up with some complicated rules to determine which families are quote, deserving for some assistance with their mortgage. We were well-intentioned trying to be you know, prudent stewards of taxpayer resources, but it ended up we didn't help very many homeowners. And the housing downturn was more severe because we had narrowed the program. By the way, that was under Presidents Bush and President Obama. It was equally true. So one of my lessons from that is right now, we need to err on the side of being generous, helping as many small businesses, as many nonprofits as we can to retain their workforce. It is much better if we're gonna spend a dollar it is much better to spend that dollar helping a small business retain its staff than to lay off the staff and then have to spend that dollar on unemployment benefits on the, on the back end of that. It's much better to keep the workers attached to that business so that when the crisis is behind us, we can then turn the economy back on as opposed to having to reorganize the economy because the workers are all on the sidelines, the small businesses are in bankruptcy, and it's going to take months or years to put it all back together again. Who am I to make suggestions to the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis? But that sounds like a terrific op commentary piece for you to edit because those, those points are so important. Thank you. It was, uh, it was actually written in the Washington Post, so I can send it to you. Oh, okay. Well, I should have done my homework better. No, Thank that's you for great. anticipating my question. <laughs> uh, that's terrific. We're coming to a sort of wrap-up time at 12.52. I want to express our great thanks to all of our partners, the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits, the uh, Federal Reserve District of Minnesota, uh, my wonderful colleagues at the JCRC, our panelists, you've all done a terrific job of answering questions and when we don't know, admitting that we don't know. I want to say a huge thanks to everyone that's watching, 300 plus people, many of whom represent different sectors of the nonprofit community. Thank you for all that you're doing. And of course, our most deepest and fundamental thanks to our first responders as well as our medical care folks who are on the front lines with their missions of mercy, trying to help as many people as possible under remarkably different, difficult, if not unprecedented circumstances. Uh, but maybe President Kashkari, if you would like, if you could sort of offer us a few last words here as we conclude, that would be a great way for us to adjourn, keeping in mind that hopefully we at some point, maybe we'll come back and we'll continue the discussion and all continue to offer resources. Yeah, thank you, Steve. And thank you to your partners and everyone for having us and the 300 or so people who are tuned in. You know, we all have a role to play. This is, you know, remember after 9-11, go back in time. After 9-11, the message was get out there, go to the baseball games, go to the movie theaters, don't let the terrorists ch change our way of life. And that was the right response. The response now is the opposite. The more we all take social distancing seriously, at home, at work, with our neighbors, et cetera, the more we can slow the spread of the crisis, the virus, and the more chance we give to our healthcare first responders to catch up and do their vital work. So we all have a really important role to play, and we will get through this. You know, our political system is working as it should. Our both parties coming together to put the American people first, and that they've said that they're already working on version four, or maybe, maybe more yet to come, but we will get through this, 
And uh, I've seen it firsthand in 2008. I'm really confident we'll get through this again. But there's going to be some, you know, scary times in the near future. But we'll get through it and we'll, uh, we'll help each other. So thank you. Uh, with great thanks to Sammy and Anthony and Ethan of our JCRC team, to Aline, Marie, uh, everyone who's watching today. I believe there might be website information and other pieces so, of information that have been posted. So, Steve, I just posted a link. And I'm sorry, I was trying to find it earlier. It's hard to talk and find links. Tomorrow at 11 a.m., um, my colleagues in D.C. Uh, and around the country who I've been so helpful for in understanding the PPP program are, ex are specifically doing a program for the, for the whole country, for anyone who's interested. And so um, there's a link there. You may have to take my name and email address out of it. I'm sorry. I was just cutting and pasting for my email. It's sort of an auto thing. But it's, it's free. It's, it's, they're going to answer all the questions that we weren't able to get to about the PPP program, how, what you can use it for, how long you can use it. Um, I highly recommend if you want to apply for this program and you haven't figured it all out yet, and that, that includes me, that you tune in tomorrow at 11 a.m. for that webinar all about the program. I, I think it will be very helpful. And I see that Marie has just posted a directory, the special edition. We'll, we'll try to figure out a way to get these links to people um, who've attended this, this meeting, either on Facebook or um, on, on the Zoom webinar. Um, we, we, we just all want to help. We all have to help each other. Very good. I thank you on behalf of the Federal Reserve District of Minnesota and its president, Neil Kashkari, Minnesota Council of Nonprofits, the Jewish Community Relations Council of Minnesota and the Dakotas. Please stay safe and stay well, and we'll be back in touch. Thanks so much.